because okay, so it let's, does let's not keep, handle. Let's, let's keep moving, guys. Ship is moving all the time. And okay. the smaller one down there, that actually is I, uh, a grenadier. So my kind of oh, a very tiny one. when we're doing this is uh, when I'm out at the end of my tether, I find something to look at. And so uh, uh, people. Flowers, if you're all right with that. Oh, there's a lot of loofah talk happening. Yeah, there, I'm saying <laughs> people are like commenting <laughs> about the loofahs yeah, that Thank they're you, dry everyone. gourd. So for example, if okay, I cool. It's a plant. Right. Yeah. A really cool sponge. Well, and learn something. Fill us in. I, I want to learn about loofahs. So. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I do think, uh, if possible, if Dan. I've never been a loofah fan personally. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because you're aloof? If I have the tether, I'll put them. If I don't, I'm close. Hey, Dan. Okay, there you go. I do. I do like if you're. If you're out on the end of a tether like this, this beautiful side, um, if yes, if you're if you are out on the end of a tether, I really like this kind of side uh, slipping back and forth as we wait for the uh, as we wait for the ship to come. I think this is really excellent use of space, and it'll, it'll kind of fill in like a kind of zigzag pattern on our uh, photogrammetry model. What are we looking at right now, Taylor Ann? Is that yeah, a sponge so or a coral? It okay. looks like it could be a Chrysogorgia. Okay. Um, so yeah, it is a coral. A coral. That's pretty cool. You can cool. see some Brittosaur associates pretty. there. Is it a soft coral? Um, no. It's a hard uh, well, the, the polyps are, yes. The polyps yes. are, okay. Yeah. Don't know if um, but it still does have a, um, a skeleton there that you can see okay. in the central axis. Well, I'm so glad uh, the folks out there cleared up the loofah about thing. Loofahs, <laughs> I, I, loofahs are a type. <laughs> Wow, I always not. thought loofahs were plastic. I don't okay. know. <laughs> are they? Or are they not? This is the microplastic yeah. expert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am impressed by the number of people that knew loofahs were Man a gourds. Yeah. Gourd. I have no idea. Could we, or uh, Pete, could we please get the uh, triclops view on the upper right monitor? You ready for another move, Dan? Yep, good for another move and good for another five. Hey, uh, Pete, could we please get the Triclops view on the upper right monitor? Yeah, that's, you're talking to me. I'm I can do it. I'll Pete? do it. Uh, I got, thank you. I got full control. Here. Bridge, bridge, nav, two zero zero seven five. All right, so if you had to choose one, would you rather see a coral or a sponge? And I, I'm throwing this up to the web, too, like folks. Do you like corals <laughs> or sponges <laughs> better? So which way can you work I'm out? I'm a sponge gal, personally, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> Not a loofah. Oh. <laughs> um, that's a hard one. I know. Yeah. There's some it's, really impressive what, sponges out Maggie's there. Maggie's coming at us with the hard questions. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'll just we go back to the lounge. I'll see myself out. We're going to ponder life over here because we don't know. Um, I guess it depends on the sponge or it depends on the coral. Here right. comes the sponge now. Oh, yeah. I think the, the sea Here spoke for us. <laughs> Another eupectelid. Uh, looks like this is a stalked, potentially a sacocalyx. I can uh, zoom in there with you. A viewer saying there's two kinds of loofahs, the plastic ones and then the gourd ones. Uh, I was hoping you were opening <laughs> with a joke. Oh. Like there there are two kinds of loofahs in this world. <laughs> yeah, so well, but no, but see, there, like Taylor Ann was right, there are plastic loofahs. True. That's, yeah. <laughs> and, and plastic sponges, too. So okay, yes, Dan. This is a sacocalyx sponge here that we're looking at right now. What's it, what's it called? Uh, Sacocalyx. Okay. So it's a stock so pectelid. And most of the things that I'm saying, unfortunately, do not have common names, um, well, or else I would be they, saying those. Let's <laughs> make them up. Yeah, yeah. Why well, is that? Is it just because they're just uncommon? <laughs> Which yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, we don't yeah. see them as much? Yeah, I think okay. the things that, um, in the deep sea, a lot of the things in our, our guide here don't have common names. And if they do, it's just from, you know, folks like us sitting in control vans talking about them. And oh, like the E.T. sponge? Yes, nope. yes. I was uh, going to say the loofah sponge, but do we already have a loofah uh. sponge? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really reminded me of a loofah. Taylor, <laughs> and I'm going to take this moment while Dan's unwrapping to interrupt the photogrammetry and have a little bit of a break on the file naming here. Okay, sounds good, Roger.
A uh, viewer says coral. A couple of viewers are saying coral. Coral, coral. Mm -hmm. Someone's saying that they spent an hour identifying uh, all the coral right in an now. aquarium when they were six. Oh, oh, that's lovely. That's amazing. What that's a good so use of cool. time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, honestly, I learned everything that I know about deep sea coral and sponges just by sitting in this control van for <laughs> hours on hours and listening to you Steve okay Oskovich, uh, our lead science uh, manager uh, and coordinator here on the Nautilus. So. Steve Oskovich? Yes, he he's is, an expert. Yeah, he <laughs> is the... Does encyclopedia of coral. Too, you yeah, so the so first time I sailed on Nautilus 10 years ago, well, Steve was a, was an intern. Now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, you know what else like really blew my mind? This is not related at all, but Sorry. it turns out that Ignacio's mom was born in Eagle Pass, born and raised in Eagle Pass, where oh. I'm from. Oh. Yeah, it's a really small world. That's not such a small yeah. yeah. It gets a lot smaller when you head out to sea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're at home and you are yeah. interested in okay, a I'm starting like this, it up one more time. Awesome. Okay, Roger. Uh, you can start learning now by yep. watching along Hopefully. with the live streams and practicing identifying the the organisms that we see. Here we can see a yellow coral fan in the center. Uh, not too close, so I can't really ID it right now. But yeah, have fun. Join along. Uh, you can use the NOAA Benthic ID guide to follow along and try to find the different species as we identify them. Taylor, and how does somebody find the NOAA Benthic Sea Guide? Yeah, so if you just Google um, Benthic Deep Sea Guide, uh, it'll come up. Um, and it's usually the first search on Google. Can you spell Benthic spell for, for me? Five, yeah, yeah B-E-N-T-H-I-C. All right, B-E-N-T-H-I-C, gotcha. Yes. And huh. then you just have like a search function on there. So when, you're, when we're seeing certain sponges, you can just search and find that sponge. So it would be really nice if it worked that way, but um, since everything is kind kind of scientifically named in here, uh, the best way to do it is to use the available taxa dropdowns. Um, so it is a little taxing if you haven't learned any taxonomy. Get <laughs> um, it? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't wow, really that's yeah. a good one. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sorry. Is Dave in the room? Yeah. <laughs> I did just make a dad joke. Um, but they do have the different taxa um, that that are listed here. So you can you can learn a lot about what goes in each type of taxonomic group just by looking at these drop downs. So if we're looking at fish, for example, you would go to chordata and click on vertebrates. So fish are vertebrates, and you can see all the different types of fishes that we could potentially see down here. Um, most likely we'll see eel-like fishes um, or ophidiform fishes, which are the um, grenadier fish. Okay. Ah. Yeah. So yeah, it, I think it took me a long time to kind of get familiar with just using the drop down buttons. But uh, after a while, yeah, you, you get to get used to it and remember where things go and how you can find them here. Um, and when you click on those, it'll bring up a suite of 100 or more pictures of different organisms that you can look through that has uh, the depth ranges and the locations around the globe where they'll be. Um, and yeah, different coloration morphs. So you and can then kind of play detective a little bit. Like we yeah, know we're awesome. at a depth of around 800 meters. We know we're in the Central Pacific. Exactly. So, okay, and okay. that's a way we can also uh, help identify new species if we're like, oh, this is something that we're not used to seeing at this depth range, but it looks very similar um, to another coral that we have seen before, um, but it might not actually be, which is why uh, we will collect samples sometimes and do a genomic study to, to see how closely re related it is to its shallower counterparts. Um, we have a question. Are all sea sponges actually soft and squishy if you touch them? Mm -hmm. No, actually a lot of them are, uh, have glass spicules. So the ones that we've been seeing so far on this dive all have glass spicules. So they kind of, they're squishy, but um, kind of crunchy more so than soft. So Wait, um, one for us here. Yeah, copy that. They're also suggesting Dan. that uh, the open. NOAA Okeanos website has a guide. Yes, oh. yeah, that's also a really great guide. Sorry, Better? Larry just came in with some snacks. Yeah, that, everybody's gonna get really <laughs> quiet because we got cookies. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that's Taylor. one thing that I love about Nautilus, or hate, I don't know, <laughs> that we get snacks every day at 3 o'clock, and it's like this mystery of what is it going to be. So today it's like, are these oatmeal cookies? <gasps> well, yeah, I can't tell. The whole time, so. There's definitely oatmeal in them with like a lot of sugar. They are delicious. Uh, Maybe brown think, sugar Aaron, oatmeal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you can come up. Five. 
Yeah, uh, the yellow coral that we were looking at earlier um, was actually a coral covered with zoanthids. Dan, you want to zoom out? But I'm not sure where that went. But. What's a zoanthid? Um, it's similar to a coral. So it's in the same, um, it's in Nidaria. Uh, are you go wide um, there? But they're, yeah. rather than, uh, they're, they're still colonial, but uh, the polyps are a lot different. Uh, um, they don't have their own skeleton, so they will grow onto other hard surfaces. Okay, gotcha. We've seen some so larger you don't want to do any zooms, is what you're saying? Oh, I didn't. I it, I did not say I don't. Who? It would it would be my preference to just as rapidly as possible keep scanning back and forth, going doing laterals as we're waiting for ship moves, just like that. Yeah, but not stopping and and looking at the roses, just uh, just pirouetting around them. We. We don't have time to smell the roses around here. No, nope. no, nope. we I just like the roses. <laughs> We've just got a document. nice compliment. Uh, it said this live stream has been so neat and educational for my oceanography classes. Thank you for all for being so interactive and knowledgeable. Well, thank you for sending us your questions, and uh, please continue to do so so we can answer them. I feel like I learned so much from just the questions that people ask of us, and then throwing it up to the room and learning from all of you guys and gals, and it's pretty incredible. We have another question. What senses do sea sponges use? Do they have senses, touch, smell, etc.? No, <laughs> not like us, no. Um, they do not. They don't have a central nervous system like we do. Um, but that's a great question on how they respond to their environment and how they know where to settle in order to be uh, vertical enough in the water column to be able to filter feed. That's really important. Um, and that's what they they do in, in the larval stage before they settle because once those, once a sponge settles it's there for its entire life so if it chooses a bad spot it might not live for very long yeah. do they have chemical sensors of any sort or? i believe so A viewer uh, suggests that Herc needs a nose to be able to sniff things. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, not, so they that's, have a, that's actually not so, so far out, <laughs> in a way. Because no, that's what all these senses are about. You, you can have a thermometer, you can have a something that samples the water and, and start tracing chemicals, and it, it's, in a sense, sniffing things out. Like eDNA, kind of, right? Yeah. Yeah, OK which is environmental DNA, which we collect sometimes using ROV Hercules. Ollie, isn't that something well, that you're really interested in, is the eDNA? Yeah. <laughs> I see you with a cookie Sorry, in your mouth. <laughs> Sorry to call you out. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting, and I hadn't heard about it until um, we went to the training to be um, science communication fellows. But then later on, it was actually um, my school subscribes to Science World, and they were actually they're actually using eDNA to to disprove Loch Ness, um, you know the Loch Ness monster because oh, totally. um, uh huh so so really cool. Um, so well, yeah, if that's, e the if that's the case, I don't like eDNA. <laughs> oh no, how dare the eDNA? <laughs> I'm very pro Loch Ness personally. <laughs> who is uh -oh. that? The Manila over there? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I mean, who, how could you not be pro Loch Ness monster? I Ellie? know it is it is kind of yeah it's Nessie, Nessie, right? yeah. Okay. it is a little heartbreaking. Um, but yeah, the, I, uh, so they they collected eDNA at, at Loch Ness and and couldn't find anything that, that uh, yep. you know would it's, would genetically match what uh, had been described. Bit, no. Yet, zero, yeah. Zero, now maybe five. they you know they were just in the wrong section. The eDNA it's was over five, there. No, if you want to do yeah. a five zero mm -hmm. move, you're welcome to. Okay. I'll maybe Ness doesn't have DNA. This. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's one of those like if you believe it, it exists. And they don't believe uh, in, in Nessie. Well, and you know what? Do the, uh, shorter Lock Ness, or we Nessie doesn't believe the, in you if you don't believe in, in Nessie. <laughs> you just right. Nessie <laughs> <up here. laughs> Okay, Roger. So we actually, we work with uh, Dr. Meredith Everett, um, who works for NOAA, um, with uh, the eDNA samples that we collect. So she provides a lot of the materials. Um, so essentially how an eDNA sampling event would work uh, is we would ideally look for an area of high coral density and diversity. So have lots of different types of corals, um, 
and we would take a water sample or a Niskin sample, um, which is this bottle on the ROV that you can press. Oh, Perfect are you pirouette. To talk? Sorry, Damn. Jonathan. <laughs> um, so yeah, you would use this Niskin to collect water from exactly where you're at in the water column. And this way, any DNA or like s shut off uh, tissue from organisms um, floating in the water column would be captured in that bottle. And we would then filter it and be able to do uh, DNA an analyses to be able to see what types of organisms were nearby. Uh, if it's something that we could or couldn't see, or if it's coming up different than what we would expect based off of the species Drop that we that identified in the, the area. Uh, so sir? That's Here really fascinating. Yeah. And like, it is. Yeah, it's just like, it's so exciting. I just had um, former SDF Brittany Munson text me and she wanted to say hi to everybody on here. So we have to <laughs> give our give our SDFs a little bit of love. We miss you all. <laughs> hi. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting us. Yeah. Oh, I think my mom is watching. Hey, mom. Speaking <laughs> of. Uh, and somebody's asking, can you smell underwater? <laughs> <laughs> Really you could try. Zero, <laughs> not, zero, not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear from me. <laughs> One thing that's kind of funny is that some sponges that we've collected actually do have a smell to them. Oh. Uh, yeah. So some sponges have like a sweet smell. Oh. Others don't smell like anything at all. And I've noticed that some also do smell savory. Um, there was a, a sponge expert that was out here on the Nautilus with us a couple years ago. I can't her name? I can't think of her name at the moment, but. Um, yeah, that was one thing that we logged in our wet lab observations, if the sponges had a smell to them or not. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of interesting that, yeah. That Are there any theories as to why some might have certain smells and you others know, I'm not? I'm not too sure, but huh. um, that it, that would be something worth looking into. And I'm sure um, the scientist that I'm thinking of that I just can't remember her name probably would have a great answer for that. Yeah, that would be really interesting to to figure out. Whoa. What's oh, that? What's that? Hmm. Huh. More carbonate in a weird formation. Oh, oh interesting. Oh, okay. Can't tell. Can can we smell Kay. these roses, Jonathan? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Do a spin around it. <laughs> what do you think, Larry? I don't know. I don't know. It's odd that it's just one little clump right there. No, yeah. I think it's dead coral. Dead, yeah, right. coral. Or dead sponge. Or sponges. Or dead yeah. sponges, yeah. R.I.P. Yeah, it could have been a very massive sponge that fell down, but or a couple of them. So yeah, if a sponge falls over, it's unable to filter. Since feed. we're uh, since we're kind of centered up here, can we do uh, lasers on for about twenty seconds? Sure. Any calibration mark. Honor, honor this dead sponge. <laughs> Taylor Ann, somebody's asking about the NOAA guide and how the depths work. Uh, they're looking at the corals, and there were hardly any for eight hundred meters, but a lot around six hundred meters. Yeah, so it just depends on which coral tax uh, taxa you're looking at. Um, there are a lot more deep, so like bamboo corals, for instance, which I think here are listed as. Let me check. And, and if at some point and when you're done, can we get a zoom in? And, uh, yeah, so this is a good uh, moment to pause from my aspect, sir. Just for your information. Uh, viewers out there were at 757 meters depth. Yeah, so not all corals are seen at all ranges and depths. So, um, but corals like bamboo corals are often really seen in the, in the deeper depths. Um, so yeah, it just depends on which uh, drop down window here you're looking through. So if you go to octocorals, then gorgonians, a lot of those corals are seen wow. at deeper depths. Now that is cinema cam view. Is yeah. <laughs> I am so, I'm a very, little very overwhelmed. Very, very eerie there, Jonathan. You know, okay, I don't video know. Zoom I'm, I'm, in. I'm, I'm still confused. That. Yeah. Well, you can see how much of a different view that is, actually, from between the two cameras. Oh, wow. Yeah. Somebody's right. commenting that it looks like a sponge tumbleweed. Ooh, hello. Got a fish flying through. Watch out. Oh, oh ghost fish. Hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I'm not convinced it's... Uh, Shrimp. Shrimp count. Shrimp too. Oh, hello. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> wow. 
well you don't think it's a sponge i i, I, don't, I, yeah. I don't think so i don't I, think so either no. Looks really too solid yeah, it, um. it just could be just some some strange erosional sure. do you think this is calcium carbonate okay. as well or a different yeah yeah, I, I, right. yeah. I, yeah I, That's interesting. 60 seconds. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you, guys. Cool. Thanks. That was neat. Okay. Sponge Atlanta tumbleweed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And someone comments that thank you for including yet when talking about finding something or not finding something yet. <laughs> True. True that. Yeah, we never know what we're going to find on these guys. Yeah. That's true, though. It's the spirit of exploration. So if that wasn't, you know, dead coral, what was it? Well, it could have been... We, I'm back on photogrammetry now. ...carbonate outcrops, and it, it could be just uh, oh. a carbonate outcrop you good that, for another 40 that's eroded meters, in Dan? a very What's that? strange way. But, uh, oh, yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, skirt the edge of this as much as possible. Right. Warp 5, please, sir. Carte blanche to move as, as fast as we can. Maybe you can get Atalanta and the boat to move at warp speed. But yeah. Are I we think back that's in a this bad thing to say, Jonathan. Yeah. We have a set speed that we move the boat. Yeah, it Atalanta seems like it. Safety, so. We're seeing that kind of carbonate. We've seen what happens when we move too fast. <laughs> Somebody's so suggesting petrified dinosaur vomit. Atlanta that would be a exactly lot of vomit. Clear. Dan, you ready for another? Um, also, to answer your question from earlier about how Four sponges zero. sense their environment, zero they actually have zero. cilia in the center cilia? of their osculum, mm -hmm. which is that hole in the center of most sponges you see that they use Four to zero, zero uh, eight zero. sense. So those are their sensory, not organs, but um, cells. Yeah, so cool. That, that like, kind can, of big uh, center Jonathan, tunnel. Just FYI, yeah. we can yeah. warp yeah. speed when the ship is stopped at, on our tether length. But yeah, we'll but I wonder if they would be able to, to sense that smell of any like nearby sponges. Yeah. You're gonna get someone in trouble with that. Something like you know, like animals yeah. have pheromones. And yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Sure. Steve Oskovich actually was talking about. Um, he gave a lecture on one of our previous dive uh, expeditions, and um, he was talking about eDNA and how top. certain corals give off more mucus than others, and how that can kind of uh, mess with you know, how we determine right. how, like, coral populations you, in certain well, areas. Like the concentrations of them. Yeah, so, so some of them shed a lot more mucus uh, than others, about, and I'm, I wonder if, like, some of that mucus smells better. or does it smell too, like, it, is that? Yeah, <laughs> it kind of does sometimes. It does? Yeah, so bamboo corals, which I'm not uh, sure, this might just be a primnoid, but sometimes bamboo down, corals okay. look similar to me. Um, but bamboo corals tend to have a, a really thick mucusy layer on the outside of them. And the way you can tell it's a bamboo coral or not is if it'll have black bands um, that make it look together. like bamboo. Huh. Black bands on the right. stalk or on the... On the stalk, yeah, okay. and t the escalicon. So they're proteinaceous black bands yeah. um, that you can yeah, see. Yeah, see what you're getting um, at. Yeah, there's a good example. Band coral that we're looking at? So I think this is a prim nowhere. Okay. <laughs> okay. The stereo cameras are getting the awesome yeah. 2D view. <laughs> and but, yeah, and it's, it's very to eerie to, to, see, to, to see the... <laughs> Yeah, you're actually getting four views there, right? So cinema captain's looking down at it. The stereos are straight, and Zeus is somewhere in between. I love it too. All right, we happy with that angle? <laughs> the pilot will no longer touch the Zeus camera. One less button I have to deal with. You don't mind the uh, hotness on the top of the uh, Zeus picture? No, I really don't. It's okay. Yeah, that's okay for photos as well as the blown out video. Little, yeah, totally. Little right. baby coral. Yeah, we got rock. some more here. How long do coral typically live? Does it vary quite a bit between species? Yeah, but yeah, they, it does, but they can live up to hundreds of years. So the usually the larger the coral, um, the older, but things grow very, very slowly in the deep sea. Um, so it's a lot harder to, to age coral by looking at them. Why do they, why does it age or, or grow rather so much slower in the deep sea? Is it just there's less nutrients? Is that kind of, yeah? Yeah, just less availability of, of what they need to grow in the water yeah. column. Um, as Taylor, in. Yep, yeah. yeah. Trappist was telling us that they're dated like tree rings. They have annual annual growth rings. And 
Taylor and any idea on uh, cousin it? They're here? like underwater trees. What was that? Sorry, I can't hear you. Any ID? Any ID on cousin it here? This is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is actually a. I cannot pronounce it. So it's in. Uh, it's a Chrysogorgia day. Uh, Roden Ritagorgia, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, so it looks very similar to the Ritagorgias, um, but it's in the family Chrysogorgia day or the the grouping Chrysogorgia day. Uh, we have a question. What's the temperature of the water outside Hercules? It is currently 5.42 degrees Celsius. Is there a way folks at home could get that information to Ale? Uh, yeah, if you actually go uh, look to the right of the screen. Um, let me open this up. You're going to see um, the late live data. And so you'll see that we're using Hercules and uh, depth. Uh, of Hercules, and then you'll see Atalanta in its depth, and then uh, water temperature in Fahrenheit, which maybe you're a little bit more familiar with, um, depending on where you live. Uh, the ship's heading, the wind speed, the wind angle, all of that is there, and then you can even click more data. And uh, you can scroll down and read more about the expedition and who's currently on watch. Lots of information, lots of facts. You can um, learn more about the technology that we're using on board and, and uh, just the, you know, the Nautilus in general. Um, and if you're an educator, you can sign up for uh, live ship to shore interactions as well. And somebody called it the giant feather duster coral. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't know that was my house. house. Stick. Yeah, they kind of look like, <laughs> bottle, like uh, bottle brushes. Yeah. yeah. Is it a form of bottle brush? I think that might be a common name that we've picked up on, yeah. Uh, so somebody's asking, how long do sponges live, and how would you estimate these, uh, how old would you estimate that these you sponges are? Yeah. Uh, I would guess at least, Three, mm, you know, it's, it's really hard zero. to say. Um, zero, but eight, zero. Yeah, they can live right up there. to hundreds of years. Wow. Okay, so both sponges and corals. Sorry for the dust storm there. I'm moving way faster than I would usually. That is wild. Right? Stuff. Yeah. So, like, thinking of the history of humanity, like, <laughs> what if yeah. these corals have been around for, like, major yeah. human events? Down here completely unbothered. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and here we come along with our yeah. Yeah. noise and, and lights. That's why it's so important to have a great pilot like Dan, who's very, very careful maneuvering around these, you know, very, very old beings that have been here way longer than we have. Um, yeah, so we're really thankful for uh, like Dan's expertise. Yeah, it oh. looks like it might be... Might be past it. Buttercup. Uh, so cool, you can organic. just see that in the down cam, huh, Dan? Do we have uh, is Triclops going out on the satellite feed? Yes, it is. Yeah. Awesome. What is that little white yeah. square yeah. thing? I can't, I can't tell if it's something man-made or... Yeah. It's very angular. It is very well, what's angular. What's in Hawaii? I'd say oh, it's book an in. ice scraper. <laughs> Yeah, is it? That's very like New a England of you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I just got some photos from home, and it it definitely snowed overnight in Montana. So oh, wow. It's going to oh, be no. it's full winter when we, I go home. Yeah, we're supposed to have a cold Halloween in, in Texas. In yeah. it's 80 degrees. It's 80? 80 wow. degrees. Wow. That's crazy. Speaking of Halloween, did you all bring costumes? Shrimp? Of course I did. Naturally. Naturally. <laughs> I definitely bought one in Hawaii because I couldn't fit one in my luggage. In your carry-on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but there. Larry, there's, don't there's say you didn't awful. bring a costume. Yeah, Larry, you're looking. Off, you're looking awfully guilty Aww. over there. <laughs> it's a surprise. I just I brought a Frankenstein shirt and uh, socks. I didn't bring a costume. So. That's oh. more than enough. Wait, did you just tell us what it was? Yes. <laughs> I didn't hear it. Oh, was that supposed to be a secret? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could we could start uh, dropping hints for what our costumes are, uh -huh. except for you, Taylor Ann, because you just <laughs> <came away. laughs> just put it all out there. Yeah. Uh, with the stereo camera zoomed in like this, and yeah. He, he there Did you bring a costume? Up above Zeus is just oh yeah. <laughs> Nirvana. I can't tell you how magical it is. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, in truth, uh, I actually would. When, when I would thing? allow another ten to ten degrees or so of down tilt on that Two days? cinema cam. Does that make you happy too, huh? Uh, yeah. I'm interested well, to see whether the porch in its normal configuration would be seen yeah, with the zip, zip it, cinema cam. You see the dark shadow on the bottom of it? Yeah. And yeah. But what? Uh, let's have a look next time we get on a vertical. Yeah. What it sees. But yeah, it's nice to have just a hint of the porch at the bottom when you're on the vertical stuff. Yeah. Because as you're coming down, uh, you can see, you know, what's below you. <laughs> yeah. In truth, I you'll see that I zoomed in just slightly because the the French flag there on the right hand side, your piece of plastic, just a oh, little yeah. bit in frame. Oh. Uh, I can I can uh, poke it out a little bit more. Let's see, max zoom. So, uh, yeah, let's come up ten there. I'm gonna come up pretty fast here. It's a bit vertical. So here's a good example, you know, where we're looking straight down there with it. So yeah. I can get close and it gives me a good view of like if that was a vertical how 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 close I am there. It's on a hair my better example and come back down where it's vertical. So uh, yeah, it's really helpful for Yeah, that's nice. That's really nice. Yeah, I see uh, what you mean about being able to just, just that extra two meters, maybe. That's just absolutely huge for spatial awareness, which we didn't, have never had on this vehicle. Pretty cool footage. Yeah, I'll take it. I would, I would love more. It also helps uh, for coming up too, so I can see how close the cinema cam is. Yeah. So you know. Yeah, it gives you the spatial awareness of how far you are away from stuff in two, in with two different perspectives instead of just the uh, Zeus camera. Yes, please. Yeah, I keep coming up. All right, crossing the 700 meter mark. For those of you just joining us, we are um, just kind of around the, the big island of Hawaii, looking for some coral and uh, imaging this area around here to, to create these uh, 3D models. Just around the river bend. The uh, stereo camera zoomed in on uh, being horizontal like that. It's also a really good. Uh, I'm getting spoiled by it already for the spatial awareness of uh, yeah how high the vehicle is. Yeah. Yeah. Especially on the hill like this. It's, I could get used to this. The question is, is, can we get good enough stills out of those to... Ready for another move down? Uh, no, we, we got to switch the cinema on the, and we can run that. Dan, you ready for another move? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. Four zeros. Just that one zero. extra millimeter you're going to get out of the uh, 15 millimeter lens up top. Right. It's going to be huge for you. That's it. It really is the right camera. For the still cam? For uh, no, for the brow cam, and then the still cam is the cinema cam. But then you won't have the uh, photogrammetry, right? Um, I could take both, honestly, if I'm being really honest. I think that that's a good result out of this whole thing is because we ran it. We ran it in that configuration once. Or did we? Oh, some more interesting geology here. Yeah. See in the fish eye can't viewpoint how far this must go. Um, somebody's asking it, uh, how many times has Dan banged Hercules' head 
on overhangs. On this dive? <laughs> uh, they don't more. specify. Countless times. <laughs> but but they were all just gentle boops. <laughs> so, yeah, a boop. boop. I'm, I'm curious how many times Jason and Quinn have bumped their heads on the ship. <laughs> yeah, they are very tall. Yeah. Oh, um, my, wait, you mean when it's on deck? I thought you were yeah. talking about the rock. <laughs> Uh-oh, what am I hitting? Watch out for that cliff. That's a, that's a shrimp, isn't it? Oh, Sh it. shrimp count. Yeah. What are we oh, at? Yeah. Six, seven. My athletes are not on. Maybe there are those. That would help. I should keep a tally on this whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should um, start a compet a friendly competition between watches. Wager, wager something between which watch can see which watch can see the most shrimp. <laughs> which, which watch? <laughs> which watch? Blown off the nose screen. You can uh, center on Atalanta if you want. Oh, yeah. So the most common species that we've been seeing here so far are Norella, um, primnoid corals. And if you, oh, here comes a new one, a yellow coral. It could just be covered in zoanthids, so. Um. I'll never know because I can't zoom on it. Uh, I oh, can in post, no worries. This is a good question. Will uh, these imagery cameras be a future fixture to Hercules? So is we this hope. something that's going to be permanently on Hercules? Uh, this is a pretty specialized tool, and I wouldn't expect that it becomes a permanent arsenal. Um, certainly not in the near future. Um, they're large cameras are large, undeniably large, and um, the processes required to handle the, the amount of data that comes out of a camera of this resolution is, is still not an inconsiderate um, challenge for, for Nautilus or, or honestly anyone that's, that's doing this kind of work um, out at sea. So um, we already did run it um, as our new primary imaging devices during our expedition to Johnston Atoll which worked extremely well. It takes absolutely gorgeous uh, um, high resolution photos um, as well as video. Um, so that that's probably gonna be the nearest term uh, view in terms of seeing triclops on ROV Hercules. Um, and what we were talking, what Dan and I were discussing earlier would, would be the potential of using um, one of the cameras of triclops as a, as a um, additional viewpoint from the brow so the brow is the, the big bumper bar on top of Hercules facing forward. And if you're looking at Safid 3, the main dominant image behind the two fish eyes, that, that's the viewpoint that's given by that camera. That camera allows you to, allows a pilot to have great situational awareness of the environment around him without, while science might be using the Zeus cam to do things like zooming in and, 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 and peering around. Um, so that's a pretty compelling reason to um, investigate whether or not that could be a, a long-term solution um, to to help both help increase situational awareness for Ready a pilot for like Dan, Dan yep. and um, also provide Maybe a very unique and compelling zero, image for zero, photogrammetry like we're doing now. Uh, somebody has a prize suggestion. I think it's for the shrimp count uh, contest between the watches. Is that uh, we do a social media post on that. <laughs> Ooh, okay, wait. That just gave me a thought. You can totally shut this down. <laughs> what if we did a costume contest? Oh. What kind that of fish like is fun. that? I'm looking that idea up now. We are at 675 meters. Let's see. Some type of a raven fish. Hmm. Viewers saying, uh, I would love to see Triclops as a brow and low porch cam. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting increasingly curious about these, like, kind of white chunks that we're seeing. I agree. 
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I thought they were a dead sponge. Dead, dead sponge for sure, but uh, I agree with Larry now. I don't, I don't yeah. think so. I don't know enough about yeah. what dead sponges and dead corals look like. Can you go just go grab it with Magnum? Hold it? Yeah, I'm gonna go offline for a second to talk to the boss here. And what's the bottom covered with there too? Okay, I'm gonna take this moment of break while Dan is conversing to stop the photogrammetry and do another settings check on my cameras. Roger. I think we might have to do another uh, squat, squat lobster challenge here, considering how many we're seeing. Yeah, it's exciting to see these squat lobsters. We're seeing a lot more diversity on this site than we have. Uh, shrimp so right there. Wow. Hello. Shrimp. <laughs> shrimp, shrimp, shrimp. Another shrimp. What is that, eight now? Nine? Nine? I thought there were three in that little guy right there. Oh, yeah, I think there were three. So there's that one anemone. Yeah, that Taylor Ann, I think you need to underneath put it on the whiteboard over, over there. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed that. Imagine if yesterday we had done a, a, a crinoid yeah. count. Or the oh, other day. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> that would have been a lot. I would have yeah. needed one of those uh, number counter things. Yeah, <laughs> there would have been like thousands <laughs> of them. For, for the school bus? Count. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually use those account microplastics. <laughs> oh, wow. What's that? Hard boot. Uh, yeah, could I get a uh, uh, reboot on reboot. the tri triclop system? Uh, just confirm you want hard reboot? Yes, sir. Uh, do you want to stop while we're doing that? Yes, sir. You want to stop the ship? Yep. Bridge, Thank you. bridge nav, hold position. Ooh, that means I can find something to uh, zoom in on while you're... Madison, somebody's saying how many squats yeah, absolutely. for squats. <laughs> how many squats for squats? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. It just froze up on that screen, so you can take it off. Thank you. Thanks for thinking of that. I think it's a one for one. Like, one squat lobster, you get, you have to do one squat. Mm. But, like, it, it could add up to a lot depending on where we're diving, <laughs> you know? Looks like we're seeing a metallogorgia. We haven't... That's I don't our, think uh, seen that yet. Is that that sort of fluffier looking one on Love the right? Uh, yeah, and it has a uh, brittle star in the center. Mm. That's something that you uh, you commonly see again. It almost makes it look like a, a flower with a pistol in, in the center. Oh, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Little underwater bouquet. Which one? <laughs> oh, so right, so yeah. The, the yeah. Very pink one. Very, yeah, very fragile one. And what's so somebody's called? asking, is there anything that eats gorgeous. the sponges? Yeah. And I'm just going to start seeing. photogrammetry mode again, and then. Or is it just a matter of finding a good spot? Do you want to modify spot? your script real quick to not ping yeah. 212 to give it a breast? There's no point. Um, yeah, yeah, I believe that there are some, some. Uh, I don't know if there are shrimp that eat the sponge, but there have been shrimp associated uh, with sponges. Video, let's zoom in on, uh, how about the one on the right? Sounds good. Yeah, so this is our metallogorgia here. Ooh. Uh, and uh, you can kind of hear, I don't, under, like, uh, it's very similar to the chrysogorgia that we were seeing earlier. They both have that fragile, very thin skeleton with very fragile polyps. Just a very different formation. And, and so that, that balled up kind of earthwormy looking thing in the middle, that's not a part of the coral, right? That's no. the brittle star you mentioned. Yeah. I think it might actually be an ophiroid, which is not the same thing. Let me. Oh, and we have a shrimp in there too, at the bottom. It's like a little pink brain. You can see oh, his it two eyes. It's it is two the same eyes. Thing. Huh. Coming back. There it is. Oh yeah. yeah. Down there. Kind of hidden. Good eye. It's like playing I Spy. <laughs> Only for shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> the shrimp counts real. Okay, so you're saying that that thing in the middle is not probably a brittle star. It, I think it is actually. Oh, Sorry, okay. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, it's hard to between tell the common name and the scientific and. Um, yeah. Yes, it it's is. kind of a, just a jumble. Yeah, it looks like a bunch of earthworms. Yeah. Yeah, it just has its arms wrapped around. 
This is pretty. It almost looks like a little cherry blossom tree, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it's really, or like a dandelion. Yeah. Or baby's breath, that one. Oh, Ooh, yeah. That's, that's, a, yeah, that's, that's what that's, it is. Yeah. Nailed yeah. it. Nice zoom. Go for zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a shrimp? It is, yeah. yeah. The... It's kind of weird to like eat shrimp. We had, there, there <laughs> we was shrimp it, for like, lunch. Yeah. I didn't eat any, but I saw that it was there. Yeah. I was like, oh. It's really <laughs> good. There's been like a shrimp, like almost Alfredo-y sauce that's yeah. been circulate, circling around every so often. And yeah. that is delicious. Is that the one that had the mushrooms? Because I had a little bit of that one. There was also like a beef stroganoff that yeah. had mushrooms. That was, mm, it's my favorite. Yeah, the food I can't is really you're good. Talking about eating shrimp when, when his the, cousin uh, is sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's like getting, it's getting close to dinner time. I'm getting kind of hungry. Uh -huh. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Video, you go away, please. Copy that. Yeah. Yeah, so when we tend to see these metallogorgia, I think you will always see that association of the, the brittle star with it. Oh. Um, yeah. Oh, why is that? Uh, yeah. It allows, again, for the, the brittle star to be higher up in that water column. Hmm. Um, I don't believe it is a parasitic association. It doesn't harm the coral. Yeah, and, and actually Devin's writing in, would they have a symbiotic relationship with each other? She yeah. was just asking about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the brittle star does not harm the coral. Does the coral get any benefit out of this, or it's not that I know of? Um, Just have freeloading brittle stars. <laughs> <laughs> so, you mentioned that sponges are filter feeders. Are most coral filter feeders, or well, as well, or, or how do these deep sea coral get nutrients? Yeah, so uh, very, if we were able to like zoom really, really closely earlier, you saw those little appendages on the ends of the, the coral. Um, those are the, the polyps, and they actually feed with the polyps. So it's a colonial organism, so the coral has a bunch of polyps on it. Um, it's not just one um, polyp, um, so it uses all of these to, to feed in the water column. Um, so they can essentially grab onto food particles. And so when you say it's a colonial organism, does that mean... Each you, coral is its there, own John, organism. Or? Yeah, so it, it's a, an entire colony Still of organisms that grow on back there, uh, right one well. skeleton. Okay, he's ready to move on. Move it on. Oh, he's right left. <laughs> Rachel's taking over back here. Hey, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hello, hello. Rachel. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Right. I've uh, unbeated my mic sure. and the lightning bolts of power are coming into my hands. <laughs> Four zero zero seven zero. That's an interesting sort of white crust looking feature there. Just the cam I'm looking at. Yeah. Yeah, I think these are probably more of that carbonate we saw. Yeah. Now exposed. This looks like pizza crust to me. <laughs> okay. It does. I am the gonna food. leave and go eat some food because you all are making me so hungry. Welcome to the twelve to four watch. <laughs> uh, this is what we do. <laughs> It's like right after, it's, you were sandwiched in between lunch and dinner here. Yeah. <laughs> Very hard sandwiched. To um, yeah. You will, yeah. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for appreciating my pun there. Look at the sonar. Anytime. <laughs> Alrighty, folks, don't touch that thermostat. We got dad jokes on tap. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're ready. Um, I should zero the tether wraps now. My mom actually just sent me a mom joke today. Let me see if I can find it. What's uh, a mom joke? Two, it's a joke that your mom sends you. Great. We have a question. Do you find more soft or hard corals at these depths? So we have seen some hard corals, but not very many. So hard corals are known as reforming corals, um, but we have seen uh, not many of those. I think maybe three or four. 
um, we've seen a, an, an elapsed SAMIA reforming corals. So um, we haven't seen quite completely soft corals because they still have the calcium carbonate skeletons. Um, but we've been seeing, yeah, precious corals such as, um, I think bamboo corals are considered precious corals as well, um, which is something I didn't know. Precious corals, why, why are they precious corals? Um, I, I don't know if they were named that just because of the use of the corals. Yeah, they were used I for think, jewelry. I, I think they used for jewelry. Oh, yeah. oh like a precious gem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, they've used a lot of different species uh, to red make, corals, yeah. Red corals, black corals. Yeah, red corals, black corals. I know like Swiftia is one that is a very beautiful bright red coral that they've used to make beads. Um, yeah, but hopefully now we're just using those as inspiration for using other materials rather than the corals themselves. Very, uh, very popular in Okinawa, but we can walk Corellium on the islands down there and find them. it on the beach. So oh, wow. Around. Picking it up off the beach and making jewelry with it for a long time. Taylor and that church that I was telling you about, I just looked it up. Um, it's, I'm not sure, I'm, not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but it's Kaweahao Church on here. Oahu. Come up this um, and it's made of 14,000 coral slabs from ocean wow. reefs. Wow. Yeah, so they were hauled from the sea. Um, it looks like it was dedicated on July 21st, 1842, and it's just right downtown. Um, wow. If you go on a little walking tour when we get back to port, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, yeah, I have to look into that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Drag you like a uh, redheaded stepchild on this one, so. <laughs> Just let it happen, you know. Like I say, I can drag it on to 20 meters when I want to. Dan, are you talking to us back here? What's that? Were you talking to us back here? No. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, I got the mom joke. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. What did the sushi say to the bee? The sushi say to the bee? Like the bumblebee, yeah. I don't know. What's up, bee? <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I'm that was cute. Oh, like wasabi? That's, yeah, yeah, like wasabi. That's super cute. Wasabi. I get it, okay. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> all right, folks, we'll be here all week. And uh, remember, please try the beef. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ready for another down? Sure. Can we step uh, northeast one? Northeast one, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a cool Four feature. zero zero uh, four five. So, Larry, these rocks definitely look different than the columnar basalt rocks that we were looking at the last couple of days. Yeah, the columnar basalts were you very special because these are the ones that cooled very slowly and then were exposed. This looks much more kind of traditional, uh, not yeah. quite a, a pillow lava, but, but certainly Yeah, it's more almost pillowy, but not... Uh, but not quite, yeah. yeah. So again, it all depends on, on how much time it got to cool. Yeah, up and under 10, please. You've got a fan, Dan. Um, they're saying that you're their hero. True grace under pressure yesterday. Oh, thank you. A Dan fan. <laughs> Couldn't have done it without patience and support of everyone in this room. There's a starfish. I can recognize a starfish. Yeah. <laughs> I think well, because really of the conversations on this watch, I don't think I'll ever be able to look at the seafloor as anything other than <laughs> food items. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I wonder why that is. I tend to also use, yeah, just... It's, it is a, a little descriptor. strange, yeah. 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 I mean, like, in our defense, those the columnar basalts really did look like pizza boxes. Yeah, and, and then, then they the really onion, did, yeah. yeah. and then they really did look like ice cream sandwiches. Uh, yes. Like, that was always the first thing yeah. to come to mind. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just nature. Nature yeah. wants us to eat. It's the human brain. We look for, mm. for things that are familiar. That's true. The blooming onion, I like, and I didn't actually know what it was until we started talking about it. And then I think. You've never had a blooming onion? I don't think I have. Me either, actually. What? I didn't know. I just thought you meant like it was a regular onion that was blooming. <laughs> exactly. <No. laughs> I've only I was seen like, them at, uh, at Outback. At Outback. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you I'm need sure to go to Outback exist. Steakhouse. I'm sure they look like columnar basalts, oh, I guess. And then I, I saw a picture I today. I think it just captured it perfectly. Yeah, <laughs> it, it really does thing? look like that. I know. I've like seen them on Instagram. I feel like, but I don't know that I've ever. I don't know. Is it a Texas thing? I'm I'm from Texas, so no, I, no, I, I don't I've, think I've had so. Them in you it's an Australian thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when we had oh, Outback Steakhouse. Yeah. Because, so. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's just authentic. <laughs> Wait, is it just the way you prepare it? That's why it's called yeah, yeah, It's the it's way a, they cut it, yeah. Oh. And fry it. It's fried. Too. And then you and fry yeah. it, right? uh -huh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. dip it, it in, like, good. a batter and fry it. And that's it looks why, like a giant flour. Yeah, that's why Taylor and I was saying a I felt like a... 4,000 calorie flour. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's crazy. And then there's, like, a dipping sauce. Here you go. I got pictures up here. If you want to. Oh my gosh, I am starving. <laughs> <laughs> There's a viewer suggests that we start calling Dan the Blade. <laughs> the Blade. The Blade. Yeah. <laughs> the Blade. I think I like Delta Dan better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Although we may adopt it, I'll have to try it out a couple times. I have become very interested in geology and need to start learning a little bit more about mm -hmm. how these form and why they form differently. I know on the last uh, expedition we were seeing a lot of botryoidal or grape like textured uh, basalt rock. Um, and I'm not really seeing much of that here. What is that? All right, like? Dan, we're kind of losing the track uh, here. It almost way. looks like bunches of grapes. Oh. Um, yeah. Oh. You know, they're just very oh. grape like yep. textured. Oh, wait, um, sometimes very smooth and glossy looking Tell as well. Normally I would complain, but this is such a non-technical dive, just flying around at random, so it's not like you're going to pull me off of a critical, you know, oh my god, we have to get a zoom on that. And normally I would pull you around or zoom around like this, but it's... Looks like similar coral to what we've been seeing. There's a shrimp. From yeah. what I understand, so that's what I'm doing. So apparently, the botryoidal rock that I was talking about um, develops when there are many specks of sand dust or other particulate matter um, around that oh. would, yeah, cause it to kind of. Right, you ready for another? The, the lava to just flow over nope. it and uh, make little this, clumps. Oh, yeah, so it almost like snowballs cool into a rock. Yeah, 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 we yeah. Can do that. If you look up botryoidal, you all know what I mean. Very interesting. Zero, zero four five. Oh, there's something I mean, kind of orange or red there. Yeah, I think that's a crinoid. Did you say that red guy was a crinoid? Yeah, the orange uh, thing oh. with all the arms. Is that sure. what they're called, arms? So on like to come back on the crinoids, are they arms? Oh, I bet you they have some fancy name for them. But yeah, let me see what their scientific name is. Mm -hmm. They're in the same grouping as sea stars. I think sea stars are arms. Yeah, yeah. I believe so. And then which is it? Is it uh, squid have tentacles and octopus have arms? Is that correct? Um, does that squid also have? Okay. I thought There's octopus like, also have tentacles. Out there, doesn't a squid have like two tentacles? And the rest arms? Yeah, oh, or is it yeah. backwards? I'm not sure. They're I remember that um, Daniela 
She was teaching us all about that during the training. You know who would else know that? Who else would know that? Google. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, Danielle, you should be honored to be compared to Google. I know. <laughs> She's our resident Google. I wonder if they're in the lounge listening because Devin was uh, writing in uh, a message. So I don't know. Okay, that... yeah, you were right. So a squid ha have 10 arms, and two of their arms are longer than the other eight, and those are called tentacles. Uh, yeah, I learned that from Daniela. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks, Daniela. Yep, channel one. I think they're all in the mess uh, getting the cookies that they just uh, baked for us. Did you get one? I got two. You got nice. two? Okay, and then octopus have tentacles. Huh. Okay, we can go Learning back to so the uh, Roger. original bearing. All right, that's going to be like 085 now. 085, right? Yeah, probably close to 090 actually, but uh -oh. for you. Yes, yeah, so you. Zero <laughs> Somebody zero. wrote in these white spots look more like spilled milk or frosting. Ooh, frosting. I wonder if we have any birthdays on this cruise. So, Slow Mo's birthday is actually on the 6th. <laughs> oh, well, we'll be back at port by then. I know. Dag Nabbit. How old will Slow Mo be? Eight. Yeah, it's really just an excuse for my kids to throw a party in, in school and we'll watch a video and people will bring cupcakes and things. Okay, and like, let's, what is Slomo? Who is Slomo? So Slomo is uh, a class mascot. He, uh, yeah, and so Rachel's <laughs> picking him up and showing <laughs> him off. Wh which camera is, is going to upset that, that one? <laughs> right now it's cam one, but I can switch it to cam three. Oh, it's okay. all right. We're oh, good. Right. We're good. That's slow-mo. Hey, so slow-mo. So slow-mo has a social media following. He's got his Instagram, slow-mo love science, and TikTok, slow-mo the sloth. And uh, my kids follow his science adventures and learn all about science. And so, yeah, so um, years ago, the kids were like, when is slow-mo's birthday? And so I made a mistake <laughs> the, around the time that I bought him. And we celebrate uh, every year. So, you know, Slow-mo. He loves science. <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah. Uh, somebody uh, is commenting that yesterday it was said that arms are multi-purpose. Tentacles have one purpose, catching food. And squid have two tentacles, which only have... Um, suctions on the tips well then what are these attached to me yeah. <laughs> because i capture food with them too um, I'm, I'm surprised that you can see the bright color red so deep i thought red was the first color to disappear zero, underwater zero, zero. Yeah, well you are color correcting right yeah, yeah so um, um normally oh here's a here's oh, yeah. a joke is that the one you're pointing at rachel how many tentacles does it take to make an octopus laugh i don't know Ten tickles. <laughs> <laughs> Ten tickles. <laughs> Ten tickles. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Manel, were you saying something about the how we're kind of auto-correcting for light down here on the seafloor? Yeah. So normally what we do um, whenever we get to the bottom is we do an, a white balance so that we have the accurate colors. And then that's actually stored that that auto white balance is kind of stored in um, in this little control that I have up here, um, and that lets us see all the pretty colors, no matter how deep they may be. That okay. is very cool. I mean, to see that it happening really and then cool. like yeah, that's what uh, Larry and Jonathan were kind of talking about earlier, right? That we were mm. bringing our own light down to the seafloor. Yeah, well, we've got some fish. Ah, that's what a blooming onion looks like. Oh. Okay. <laughs> See how it looks like a flower? It but actually, it looks like columnar basalt. That's exactly what oh it looks like. Oh my gosh. Columnar basalt. Yeah. The curvy columnar basalt. From You're totally right. Yeah. With a delectable dipping sauce. Smack yeah. dab in the middle. <laughs> yes.
I haven't been to an Outback Steakhouse in like decades. <laughs> this is a uh, especially salty preparation of the Bloomin' Onion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been marinating for a while. Yeah. It's, uh, it's tough on the teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Is this, so this kind of looks like that same calcium carbonate and basalt, would you say, yeah. Larry? Yeah, I think It's so. kind of yep. like goopy. It's not pillowy, it's kind of goopy. Yeah, the basalt is, yeah, yeah. the basalt's not pillowy. It's, 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 it's so, you know, there's another type of surface lava they call uh, pohoihoi. Oh, yes. It's kind of ropey, uh -huh. ropey. Uh, uh, again, it depends on the viscosity yeah. of the magma. Well, it'll mm. come out. Out of the end of my tether here. Uh, so something uh, kind of cool I'm looking at is so is looking at this rock feature and uh, some of our cameras. So we have a lot of light. Um, a lot of the lighting on the ROV is actually pointing directly down and it has a very cool almost like a spotlight effect it actually looks like the columnar basalts on stage and it's about <laughs> to like grab the microphone and you know it's like start singing it's like Pavarotti or someone it's their moment no, I love that. pointing down there Joe. they're all pointing out it just looks like that in the cameras because you're seeing the uh, light tone but if you uh, for example uh, look at Hercules right now in Atalanta. Uh -huh. That is the angle they're pointing, which was a, uh, yeah. So a lot of them are. <gasps> oh, a ray. Oh, yay. Sure. Lower right. Wow. Highlight, highlight, highlight. Let's see it. Can we see it? Can we zoom? If I do turn uh, the down lights on, then you get the. Oh, this is so cool. Any ID on that, Taylor Ann? I am on it. Nice. On it like a bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> Has a cute little short tail. Um, somebody's commenting that about 2,000 feet, less Ready eels and more down. fish. Sure. And then us, Three, whenever you're four, finished with zero, the ray, zero, Taylor Ann, uh, somebody's asking about the rainbow colored fish with the large eyes. Uh, so I think it's a plesobastus, Dave Bessie, Davey, I can never pronounce these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let me see what the common name is for you really quick. <laughs> Somebody commented in that they want a blooming onion now. <laughs> Same. Oh, it looks like you just kind of had a collision with the rock there. That's what I did earlier in the lounge with the coffee <laughs> table. <laughs> cool. Very neat. You want to get quick lasers on for size? Yeah, sure. let's see it. So those there lasers are 10, 10 centimeters? centimeters yeah, yeah, 10 centimeters apart. So about 50, 50, 60 centimeters long. How many feet is that, would you say? 50 centimeters, so... Uh, that is four inches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So one third of a foot. <laughs> well, that, that, that's what the two green dots are, but the, the, the ray is probably 20, 20 inches or so. 20 inches. Okay, so a foot. I uh, like the view of the stingray in the fisheye lenses. Uh, the common name is just a deep water stingray. What's a deep water stingray? Yeah. Okay, I could All right, follow yeah. the ray. Yeah, no, that's enough. For, uh, yeah, hours. But yeah. Uh, Atalanta's running me over. Happy? Here we go. Yep, Thank yep. you. Up, up. up, up Somebody's up. asking if it's a skate. What's the difference between a stingray and a skate? Uh, no, uh, it's Larry saying up, up, like up the hill towards the waypoint. Yep, yep. The waypoint Nazi back there. I think the difference is in their tail on the barb, but I'm not too sure on <laughs> we that. We would never get anywhere. <laughs> follow fish around at random. But yeah, you can come up. 
Uh, and I was actually wondering this too, is the stubby tail normal or did it get chomped? Yeah, so I think that is a sign that it's not a skate, if I'm correct. Um, oh. So most rays are kite-shaped with whip-like tails, or it could have it the other way around, mm. um, with two stinging spines, while skates have fleshier tails. Oh, and a lack of spines. So, so maybe that was a skate? Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it, it must have been. I think we're around sure the same. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's see. This looks like a ski slope. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does, like snow. Let's see here. Oh, and then, so stingrays have electrical properties, it sounds like, too, and skates don't. Have you ever had a skate? I have not. I don't eat seafood. You don't eat seafood? No. Honestly, that makes a lot of sense. It, <laughs> I know people think it's because I'm a marine biologist, but it's because I just don't like the taste of it. <laughs> I often say that I'm allergic because people are like, oh, try this. I promise you'll like it. You grew up I in never Chicago, do. right? I did. Okay. Yeah. So the, the only fish that I ate was like catfish. So maybe yeah. that's why uh, maybe. I got put off the fish. <laughs> um, I love seafood. I'm going to slide out here into the mud and get back on the... You can uh, come up ten. Yeah. So it, uh, in my search, when I type in the scientific name here from the guide into Google, um, all of the sources are saying that that was a stingray, a deep deep water stingray. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm glad because that's what I put in the highlight, and I don't want to make the same mistake as the moose fish. <laughs> moose fish is probably my favorite new species of not real fish <laughs> that I've ever heard. Well, thanks for letting me sit in on your watch, everyone. That was really fun. Of course, yeah. Thank yeah. you for coming. It was really lovely to have you. Hey, uh, thanks for watching you guys. Danielle is going to take over now with the next watch.
SPL check, one, two. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Daniela Griffey for the 4 to 8 watch. We're just going to let everyone finish kind of settling in, and then we'll do a round of introductions for our watch. Yep, I've been on. Let me know when you're ready. We can start moving. Okay. Uh, right now we're going due east. Yeah. All right. Bridge, bridge, nav 40090. Zero, zero, But it looks like we see another goosefish right away. You see it? I think that's our mascot for this watch. Definitely. Number one. Number Yeah, everyone's doing shrimp counts, but maybe we should do a goosefish count. Or geese fish now. I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone kind of talks about um, fish versus fishes. Do you guys know why, when you use fish and when you use fishes? I think if it's multiple species, um, you will use fishes. And Correct. if it's fish, yeah. it, it's just one species of multiple of them. But so we've been seeing lots of goose fish, yeah. but we see lots of fishes in the deep with oh. our grenadiers and... Extra credit for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to my English teachers. <laughs> I am terrible at English teacher. I always tell my, um, I always tell my students, this is why I'm not an English teacher and I'm a science teacher, but I like how they can always find my spelling mistakes, but never their own. Oh, yeah. I, I'm pretty good with grammar, but I'm terrible at spelling. But, oh. uh, this I'm, is I'm bad at yeah, both. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is Taylor Ann signing off, and I'm going to hand it over to Zach. Um, but thank you so much for this watch. It was amazing. Have a great watch. Is that a sea cucumber? Ooh. These strings across the bottom? Do you see those lines? Is that cracks? Yeah, it looks like cracks. Okay. There are some sea cucumbers that can put out these long, it looks almost like worms, and there are these long, sticky kind of tentacles that sea cucumbers can put out. So for this dive, I think uh, they we're working our way up the slope, and we're about 100 meters from what we think is the top, and that's where we're expecting to see the sponge gardens, the corals, and really get that. Once we get up there, really the point is to do photogrammetry all along the top, so we get amazing imagery that we can then use uh, for further things. Yes, I'm very excited to see this top of this seamount. I feel like we're it's. 
been a slow climb up and it's we're gonna have a really good grand finale at the end up there. All right, I think we're just about settled in and I'll start us off on our round of introductions. My name is Daniela Griffey and I am your science communication fellow for the four to eight watch. Or I think I'm gonna start calling us the goosefish watch. Um, my daytime job when I'm not on the Nautilus is I am a high school teacher at Radford High School located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I teach marine science and AP environmental science there. Prior to teaching, I worked as a biologist. Um, I did a lot of work out in Alaska doing fisheries biology work and along also the coast of British Columbia. I even did a little bit of de uh, consulting work over in Australia and East Timor. And I'll pass it on to you, Dan. Oh, thank you. I'm Dan Dietz. I am the watch lead for this shift. And I guess my job here is to make sure that we're following through on the dive Ready plan. And when we find something interesting, to stop and investigate. To my day job, I'm a um, program officer zero. at the Office of Naval Research. So I look out for new technologies, uh, see things that are very interesting that, you know, essentially push the basic sciences. So understanding more about the ocean and then, you know, develop technologies that can go sense these. So I go all the way from science to applications. Cool. All right, Zach. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Taylor. I'm here in the data logger position. Um, so yeah, I'll be here keeping notes on everything we see, um, all the interesting animals and creatures, as well as just the geography and change in structures. Um, also, we, we're uh, part of the team spending the time downstairs building these models. Um, and yeah, when I'm not here on the Nautilus, um, I'm a grad student at UH Hilo. And I am studying uh, reef fish right now using remote underwater video systems. Um, so, yeah, um, nice to be over here, just on the other side of the island. Yeah. So I'm really curious to see what we're going to find down here. How's this view compared to the normal yeah. view you're used to on <laughs> yeah. studying uh, by, uh, the big island the, coral ecology? This is uh, much different. <laughs> um, definitely a lot more up shallow, but uh, I hear we're on our way to look for something good. So hopefully, hopefully something pops up here soon. But they got a stingray at the end, I heard. Oh, I missed that. I took yeah. a before. I've been watching in the lounge, but I took the last half hour to go outside, taking the view of beautiful Kona. Yeah. So, all right, Dave, how about we go on over to you, video seat? Hey, all. Uh, Dave Robertson, uh, video engineer. Um, uh, originally from Seattle, Washington, live in Anchorage, Alaska. Part time in the coast of Oregon, and I work in Hawaii, so I don't never know where I am. <laughs> we should start a game. Where in the world is Dave? Yeah, right. <laughs> My wife uh, it would play that game because she's always trying to figure out where I am. Uh, we bounce back and forth uh, between <laughs> Anchorage and the coast of Oregon. Uh, I've been on Nautilus since uh, 2016, and uh, helped design and, and build the uh, facility that we're sitting in. And front row, are you guys ready for introductions up there? Sure. Uh, this is Renato Kane, navigator on this watch. I also do seafloor mapping for Ocean Exploration Trust. I've been sailing on Nautilus for over a thousand days. <laughs> and Renato has the very good keen eyes and helps us. is usually the first one to spot cool things for us. Just closer to the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, you want to go and introduce yourself on SPL? Hey, everyone. I am uh, Rachel Simon, uh, data engineer, currently sitting in the Science One chair because it was because uh, it was open, <laughs> and uh, currently running the camera system and uh, downloading files. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. How about you next, Simon? Oh, you're not on SPL, Simon. Hi, uh, my name's Simon. I'm your pilot for this next four hours. Uh, fasten your seatbelts, uh, <laughs> observe the no smoking signs, and <laughs> refreshments will not be served. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, uh, originally from the United Kingdom, um, currently live in uh, beautiful Cape Breton on the east coast of Canada. Um, my first time on Nautilus, but I've been 17 years an ROV pilot. Uh, 
14 years in, in uh, industry, working in the oil and gas industry, and the last three years working in science with various companies. I'm a private contractor, so I, uh, I go where I'm asked, and uh, this time I've been lucky enough to be asked to be on Nautilus. This is my first time. Um, enjoying everything so far. All right, and Thomas, last over yeah, to uh, you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, TJ Scanlon here. Uh, similar background to Simon, uh, offshore oil and gas uh, construction for about 20 plus years uh, on Atlanta here this evening. Uh, work a dual role here with um, OET and Nautilus, uh, deck chief and uh, Atlanta pilot, and enjoying every bit of it. Over to you, Dave. Uh, I went first. <laughs> yeah, Dave's done his bit. <laughs> uh, just to, to update everybody from a navigational perspective, um, if K2 didn't already do so, we have reached waypoint four of, uh, of five. So the last waypoint is approximately 300 meters um, up the slope. Um, and that once we, as we make our way up, we're looking out for coral and sponges and um, at the top will be a kind of a kind of a shelf um, so we expect kind of still this carbonate material and the slope will level out so we're just going to keep continuing up and unless the back row wants anything else from us here um, as we as we move along Renato, can you talk a little bit about what is the speed we're traveling at and how long approximately it takes us to go between waypoints or to our next destination, I guess, between waypoints? Is sure, I'm big. not sure what they exactly... Um, I'm actually going to uh, call in a quick ship move here and then I'll respond to that question. As long as we're okay with continuing on up. Yeah, I'll copy that. Continuing yeah. up, so... Oh, bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Roger that. Uh, can we sh step three zero meters, uh, bearing zero seven zero? Thank you. Um, yeah, so we we make these uh, step moves up the slope. Um, the speeds that we're mo moving at typically in, in s for scientific e exploration is is a uh, is a walking pace point point two to point three knots. Um, if we really wanted to transit. Swiftly, we could go half a knot. Hercules has the capability to drive um, a bit faster than that, a knot or so. Um, and so for our viewers who might not be familiar with ship terms such as knots, how would we put that into kilometers per hour, m miles per hour? Uh, let's see. So one knot is approximately two kilometers an hour. It's 1.8 kilometers an hour. It's so half, half a meter per second. And uh, I don't have any more than that off the top of my head. <laughs> I just have a cheat sheet over here. <laughs> that is perfect. <laughs> I know, I think my brain either works when I'm on the ship in knots per hour and then when I'm driving miles per hour. But going between the two, even though I know both, my brain just can't, can't go between the two without a calculator. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> Especially when you drive in Europe, and then it's kilometers an hour. Yeah. So. I just follow the numbers on my car. <laughs> so anyone who's been following along in the back row, um, do we know kind of what they've been seeing so far? Is it mostly this carbonate that's been devoid of coral, yeah. or have they found um, some of the coral deeper there's down the slope? There's been a couple coral, uh, but fairly barren, so uh, we're hoping that at the top of the slope we'll find essentially what the previous dive saw, which was large numbers of diverse coral. So hopefully by the time we reach waypoint five, we'll start to see this pick up. But at this point, you know, move as quickly to waypoint five as possible safely. Sure. Warp speed. <laughs> yeah, we'll do. We'll continue on our... So um, instead of a slow walk, we're a quicker walk. Yep continue on up and uh, yeah you know I, I'm not I'm not sure from that dive track if um, some of the species they were seeing were uh, deeper down they so some of their their tracks started at 1600 we started our dive here around a thousand um, 
And then once we get to the surface, or once we get to the top of the mountain, I mean, um, they're going to want to, if, if there is a diverse set of coral and, you know, biology up there, they'd like to do sort of a gridded, gridded uh, search pattern, but we can, we can talk about that once we see where things are sure. at the top of the slope. So Zach, how's your knowledge on seamounts? Uh, not too great. Um, I know they are typically um, far from shore a lot of times. I mean, we're, we're one, uh, pretty close, but out here, the ones people typically target are more um, fishermen, and they're going yeah. dozens of miles offshore to find those. Um, but obviously, with where we're at, down at the depth, um, I mean, we're not expecting to see really the similar things. Uh, obviously, we're looking for more of the benthic environment. Um, and but why do fishermen target them? Yeah. Well, why do they? Uh, yeah. The fish tend to tend to pile up on them once in a while. Um, I mean, anything that where there's structure in the open ocean, yeah. fish like, because there's usually food around that. Um, also, we have uh, what's called fads, the fish aggregation devices or attraction devices. Um, you'll see those a, a lot of times in many areas throughout the world um, in the open water because it just gives the fish a place to, to find, which also <laughs> makes the fishermen happy when they find them too. Um, but yeah, I mean, you hear about it all the time, even trash, right? A lot of the trash has a lot of fish under it because it's shelter. Um, these little larval fish are dispersed out in this open ocean and they look for anything to protect them, so. Fishermen are some of the best sources for historical data that, you know, they always have these hot spot fishing areas. And a lot of times it's why those are hot spot fishing grounds is there's either a seamount or a shipwreck or something really cool and interesting to look at underneath it. So I think sea mounds yeah. are really important for upwelling, yeah. right? So the uh, currents hit the sea mound, forces it up, and then it brings all this nutrients from the bottom and the deep, right? We have all this, um, you guys can see on the screen, this marine snow, all this nutrients falling from the surface. It goes into the deep part of our ocean, and then these sea mounds create upwelling. And so this nutrients is brought up to the surface, and that's why you get this really abundant life at the top of our sea mounds, which is what we're hoping to see, and hopefully it will be a pretty good show for us. Yeah, and I think we've talked quite a bit um, about kind of the marine snow, right, and all the plankton and everything's in there. Um, the one thing that's also probably out here that we're not seeing, um, mostly just because our, you know, our canner systems aren't set up on this size of scale, but there's likely a lot of larval fish out in these regions too. Yeah. Um, a lot of the reef fish, they disperse off the shore because if you're on shore and you're a small fish, um, good luck to you because there's a lot of things to eat you there. There's not a lot of predation out here. Um, there's actually... Um, this is still kind of currently a big topic in certain regions of whether these larval fish disperse openly and say like uh, yellow tang or some coral reef fish that's breeding on Big Island, is it going to Oahu and spreading throughout or does it actually return home? Um, and here in Hawaii, it's, it's fairly new studies in terms of that regard, but other places, you know, they found like clownfish, they'll go right back to where they, um, where they basically, um, where birth came out of the egg, um, they, have, they, they can stay in that area. Um, and that's just because they go to these deeper areas where the conditions are much less se severe. So they can kind of just sit in place and just wait till they get bigger and then just swim straight back up. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, I don't think we're going to see those larval <laughs> fish, right? They're, they're going to be very tiny. But that was one of those things when I when I first learned of that, I just thought that was incredible to know, like, the, the depths of the ocean like this are a, a habitable place for these little fish. Yeah. Um, you mentioned clownfish, so I have a fun fact about clownfish. Oh, let's hear it. So, any viewers, if you don't want me to ruin Finding Nemo for you, I'd <laughs> recommend just muting your computer for a bit here. But, so you know how in the beginning of the movie, we have uh, Nemo's mom dies, right? Pearl gets eaten by a barracuda. Well, clownfish actually will change their sex. So, all clownfish are born males, and then the biggest... Um, mo strongest male will turn into the female because then it's the female's job to take care of um, her harem. She has a harem of yeah. males. So you have one female 
purr like an enemy and all the other ones are her males, suitors, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And so when Pearl dies, and that just leaves uh, Marlin as the most dominant male, Marlin is actually in the process of becoming Nemo's new mommy. So, Or yeah. maybe it was all just happened within like six hours before they actually changed. <laughs> I don't know. Nemo went from an egg <laughs> to a pretty big one. You it know, that's a... why and that's why Marla was so protective. Yeah, it was yeah. actually being like a protective yeah. mama bear, but mama fish. Yeah, you know? no, you're definitely right. <laughs> I'm trying to give, give Nemo some hope there. <laughs> hey, yeah. But that's a that's... pretty common um, common theme of marine life, right? Yeah. Some fi um, fish are born males and change females, and we have vice versa. And then you also have her hermaphroditic species as well. Yeah. yeah, parrotfish are probably one of the most common ones out here that we have. Um, you'll see those. You'll see the di distinct different colors, too. And then, right, clownfish, it's a little harder to tell. It's just the yeah. size, mostly. Um, but out here with parrotfish, um, the males and females are completely different colors. You'll have reds and browns for one, and then you'll have blues and purples for the other. Yeah, so um, I believe the blue are the female, correct? The blue are the males. The males. Yeah. Okay. The, the red ones are the female. female. Basically, um, you'll see kind of like one male for a bunch of females. Um, and that's why, um, like on Maui, uh, they've actually banned taking a blue uhus because mm -hmm. those, those males can actually... Um, be responsible for fertilizing a like a whole um, harem of females like you're talking about. Yeah. So taking that one male, um, it's it's debated whether that's a huge difference or not, right? If they take the one male, because the the other female will will um, transition pretty quick. But but it's still you know you have those weeks of nothing going yeah. on because that male's like been taken. Looks like we've got this wall um, here um, that we're heading towards, so we might have to bring Adelanta up as we as we come. So Zach, is that is that uh, coral out there? Um, we're heading kind of towards on the bottom, towards that, because uh, we're at our ship move is at zero nine Not zero sure seven zero. That. Could be coral. It also looks like almost like a coconut frond or something too. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. We have a viewer that is helping us out with our speed comparisons. Her is around two point five times as fast as a sloth. So I like that comparison since we have slow-mo on board with us. So Herc's a little bit faster than a sloth, but he's only about as fast, one fifteenth as fast as Michael Phelps. <laughs> no. So thank you for that comparison. Starting to see some coral here on this wall. Um, definitely looks like some mushroom coral there, the red smaller ones. And then we also have a viewer that's typed in, and don't forget about the parasitic chimer chimerism, the anglerfish. And I have to say, anglerfish reproduction, I think, is one of the strangest ways of reproduction in the deep. So yeah. the male anglerfish definitely is very different looking. I showed my students this right before I came out here. Mm -hmm. um, we actually got a sample from the University of Hawaii's deep sea ecology lab of an anglerfish that had a parasitic male on it. And so it was a fun game to see if they could try and find the male. And they're like, that, that's it. It looks like just like a little skin tag <laughs> attached to it. Yeah. All it's there is a bag to yeah. provide sperm to the female whenever yeah. she wants. So hanging on for dear life. <laughs> yeah, hanging on it literally because it the they fuse together. So the male will once it finds a female will latch on and they will fuse together and then the male no longer has eats yep, its still circulation all, the time. Yeah. all blends together. So it, it depends completely on the female and mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can have up to, I think, 11 or 12 males per one female. Which is uh, good. Keep some diversity out <laughs> yeah. there in that population yeah. of a few females. I'm thinking with our, um, with our offset of Atalanta heading, we might need to be starting to get some heading coral, a little more to, um, to port and bring Hercules that way. It seems like that's the... All right, we have a writer who's um, a viewer who's typed in asking that they want to do what we do and can have a step-by-step -step plan on how to do it. So maybe we can have everyone talk about how they ended up here on Nautilus. Uh, Dan, do you want to start off on your step-to-step -step plan of how you came to Nautilus? Or how I came to Nautilus. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't recommend that. I had to go get a PhD, <laughs> and that's a long, that's a long, long process. But I think, you know, to get to Nautilus, really you have to have the passion. 
And so um, if you really love the deep sea and you're an expert in whatever, and it's not just, you know, biology or corals or that kind of stuff. I mean, Rachel here is a data analysis and, you know, really, all, you know, technology guru, you know, or you have video or there's all kind of roles to fill. But if you want to do that, then, you know, you come in as an intern and you work your way up. Yes, so if you want to learn about those intern op options, please go visit us at nautiluslive.org. Um, and you can go over to the Join tab or the Education tab. And for teachers, um, teachers, they have an option of a teacher fellowship, science communication fellowship, and uh, they bring us on board. They give us training. Um, you get a stipend to cover your substitute, um, or, well, you either get your substitute covered or a stipend. So if you are also teaching adjacent, you're not in a classroom, maybe you're a curriculum coordinator. Um, earlier we had some SCFs that did um, took students out on Hawaiian voyaging canoes and did outdoor education. So they didn't have a classroom per se. And then you can receive a stipend to cover that time while you're out here. So it's a really incredible opportunity, highly recommended. Um, applications open up towards the end of October. So keep an eye out on our Instagram and our website we also have a lot of different intern opp opportunities for college students to come on out here. And even high schooler, we have Q out here who is a high school student um, working with our data. So if you're video engineer, ROVs, um, science, all those are intern opportunities to come out here. So I recommend starting off as an intern, making those connections, find something that you really enjoy and just have a passion for learning more about the ocean. Simon, how are you guys doing up there? Could you share a little bit about how you came to Nautilus? Uh, it was quite a, a long route for myself to get to, uh, to get to Nautilus. I spent my first career was in the Royal Air Force as a mechanic. Um, so I had a lot of mechanical experience. I have no formal engineering experience. I didn't do my Bachelor of Science degree until I was an adult. So I graduated as a 35-year-old in 2013 in physics and geology. Um, ROV wise I saw an article in a magazine and looked like it would be a cool thing to be able to do to fix and fly ROVs once I left the Royal Air Force so I uh, found a company that had a job fair and was offering lots of positions at, a, at one time during a, a major expansion of the industry and uh, was lucky enough to get a position uh, spent my very first trip offshore was looking after saturation divers so I was piloting a small ROV, basically what? being an overwatch for... Um, what are saturation divers? So normal scuba divers are probably limited. I've never done it, but around 100 feet or 30 meters. So there's, you can, below that deck, nitrogen starts to become uh, poisonous to you and not effective as a compressed gas to breathe. And saturation divers basically live in a hyperbaric chamber on board the vessel at the depth that they are going to be working at. So on board the vessel, their atmosphere will be the same as say one or 200 meters below the, below the surface, depending where they're working. And they'll breathe a mixture of helium and oxygen, which was highly amusing the first time I heard <laughs> someone speaking the whole time on helium, <laughs> trying to fix things. It was, uh, yeah, and you see these big burly men come out of the saturation chamber at the end of the, end of the thing. You've been listening to them talking like Mickey Mouse for the last four weeks. <laughs> I did. Um, I worked for a bit with a Catalina hyperbaric chamber, and so we treat um, dive accidents and things like that. And when we did our training, um, our our dive leader was this big kind of burly guy, deep voice, you know, your typical big white beard, white hair. And um, when we went down to deep, because it pressurized, you're pushing the air into the chamber to simulate pressure as if you were to be 100 feet deep in the sea without being in the ocean. And he starts singing, and even without the helium, it still affects your voice. And he started singing Under Pressure for us, and it was <laughs> one of my favorite memories. Don't worry, everyone. I have a terrible singing voice, and I will not subject you to that. I only subject that to my family members to sing them happy birthday once a year. <laughs> TJ, yeah. how did you end up here on Nautilus? 
Um, yeah, uh, I interviewed uh, there about a year ago. Um, always keeping my eye, checking out the, I suppose the pages like LinkedIn mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Uh, always had an interest in the in the science uh, science field as such, uh, and definitely exploration. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough and, and uh, feel blessed that uh, that I was chosen for the, to come on board here and, and get a job. Uh, prior to that, uh, I worked uh, offshore oil and gas in various, uh, various different regions around the world, Middle East, um, Southeast Asia, Europe, and uh, over here in the, in the US Gulf, um, in a, over a space of about 20 years. Uh, I come from a, a farming, uh, fishing background, uh, uh, quite a popular tourist town in the southwest of Ireland, Dingle, in County Kerry. Oh, I've so been I, there. I, uh, I spent my, young, my younger days uh, fishing and, and, uh, and farming, but I uh, always had a love for the sea. Spent a bit of time over in the States uh, as a child as well, on the, on the East Coast. And uh, yeah, always uh, always had a love for, for exploration and, uh, and a love for the sea, and, uh, and still do. Thank you, TJ. And you mentioned about our website, keeping an eye on that. So if you go over to the website, nautiluslive.org, and you click on the tab that says join and at the bottom you said join our team there is actually a full-time uh, position open right now it's for a five-month contract though and that is for an education program coordinator our lovely Kelly is um, pregnant and is expecting soon so I think that starts in January so if you'd like to become our education program coordinator head on over to the website and it might be your foot in the door that you need Remy, do you want to talk a little bit about the navigation track and how you get over here? Sure, yeah, there's lots of different ways that people get into this line of work um, in this seat, but I actually came from a land-based background. So I uh, was working on my master's in, um, it's under the umbrella of geography uh, with remote sensing and uh, geospatial data and geophysical processes, but I was actually working on uh, uh, in the cryosphere. So I was working on ice at high altitudes and high latitudes, um, working on sea ice up in the Arctic. And my thesis work was um, in the, uh, the high dry Andes, working on rock glaciers and uh, paraglacial features and glaciers and um, using LIDAR, so laser scanning. And then um, it was what? actually can you explain what a rock glacier is? I haven't heard of a rock glacier before. Um, it's it's kind of a, a rock and ice matrix rather than like, you know, a traditional gla glacier. You think about just, you know, ice, although there is rock embedded in it. Rock glacier is kind of um, uh, kind of this lobe, lobate form of the mountain kind of... Uh, think about it as a kind of a consequence of, of permafrost um, on a slope. In, in some ways, or um, sometimes uh, a glacier that's kind of uh, highly debris filled. Um, but uh, glacial, uh, if you think about glaciers, they leave a glacial moraine, like a trough. Um, but rock glaciers, wh whether or not they have ice in them or used to have ice in them, kind of look pretty similar. It's this low, low B, melty mountain form. Um, so I was looking in the Andes to see if the some of the features we were interested in contained ice or not, and I was using laser scanning to see if they moved downslope in the way that we would have expected. But I used the I used lidar for that, and um, then I actually came out on Nautilus as an intern in 2013, uh, working with their new multi-beam sonar system. Um, some of the remote sensing prim principles are still the same as lidar, so time of flight and um, waves through a medium, so in this case, sound through water instead of light through air. Um, so I started seafloor mapping that way and then uh, got into the ROV work um, from there. Thank you, Remy. Mm -hmm. um, and one of our viewers 
typed into the chat that you don't even technically need to be an expert, and that is very true. You can also be a uh, social media influencer. Uh, communications is a big part of this job. So if you're a writer, talented in um, taking photos, content, we have our TikTok, we have our social media aspects. This is a very big portion of this um, of Nautilus out here. And then also artists. So one of our C SCFs was Stephanie on a couple earlier, if you listen to those ones. And she did some really cool, amazing drawings that are out there. So check out her work on the website. She has some really good ones about different rock formations out there as well. Dave, do you want to talk about video pathways and how someone does a career in video and ends up on Nautilus? Uh, okay. Uh, oceanography is uh, a second or maybe even a third career for me. Um, I come from a television broadcast background. Uh, I've been the chief engineer of several TV stations, uh, production facilities. I've also done lots of live sports production uh, in uh, TV production trucks. I've designed and built TV production trucks. I've operated satellite trucks, microwave trucks. Uh, I've done all aspect of uh, news gathering, uh, live news production uh, in the studio and, and uh, in the field. Uh, and so that's over a 45 year career uh, in the broadcast industry. Uh, I was working for the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, I was uh, chief engineer of their uh, campus TV station. Uh, my boss, the director of engineering, came back from a meeting with the oceanography department and said, uh, here's a project I'd like you to work on, uh, and it's to put an HD camera on a remotely operated vehicle and go out on their ship, the Thompson. Uh, that was in 2005. Uh, I didn't know anything about uh, oceanography or uh, ROVs. Uh, I knew about HD video, and so I built a system to uh, monitor and record HD video coming back from uh, the ROV which was Jason from Woods Hole. And uh, so in 2005, I did the uh, first ever live uh, HD over IP uh, live broadcast from a ship at sea. Can you stop uh, so that um, just in that I lower corner there? I fell in love with the whole the concept. Pen, I uh, worked closely with the oceanography department until so I left the university frame. in 2013. Uh, didn't get a chance to go out on the ship again. Uh, unfortunately, I did the shore site support for that. Yeah, that little one right there. Yeah. In 2016, I, I got a call that. from uh, a former shipmate uh, on that ship uh, to, and a friend of mine that we would worked together at several other places and said, uh, I just was out on this ship called the Nautilus and uh, they're interested in upgrading their video system and would you like to consult? And I said, sure. So I uh, came to the ship in the off season uh, yeah, when it was uh, based in San Pedro, California and uh, did a uh, forensics on the on the video system uh, and, uh, and made some recommendations for immediate upgrades and then possible long-term uh, upgrades which we uh, followed through with and in 2019 we built the facility that we're sitting in now uh, 2020 we put this facility on board the ship and uh, integrated it into the rest of the ship and uh, and here I am I come out to operate it uh, still but I also train other people to operate it and eventually I'll train myself out of a job and, uh, and uh, maybe eventually I'll retire, but not anytime soon because as long as I can do it, it's, uh, it's a fun gig. I uh, really enjoy it. So here I am. I don't think you can ever be replaced. Um, oh, I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're still moving all the time. We're just kind of taking an opp opportunistic moment to take a look at what we have been seeing. Um, I've seen a couple of these so far. It's Got this uh, C pen, uh, looks like a rock pen. It's got kind of uh, that peduncle at the bottom that it used, uses to hold on. Um, saw a few of these so far, so I just want to take a look at it as we move. Hold on, Simon, you can do it. No worries, man. Zach, can you tell us what kind of animal sea pens are? Oh, put me on the spot. <laughs> I should know this. Oh. You know, I just taught a class about this as part of grad school, and I'll be honest, it has slipped my mind. <laughs> I'm not going to answer you correctly. <laughs> can you help me with what it is? <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sea pens are 
They're kind of related. Aren't they related to jellyfish? Aren't they still in that Cnidarian family? Yeah. Yes, I believe you're right. I'll be honest. I'm looking it up really quick to make sure. But yeah, I believe <laughs> that would have been what I said. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to guess. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, sea pens. I mean, they're only deep, really, too. Yeah, especially yeah. out here in Hawaii. So it's not a common one, especially like in the classroom or something that we that we talk about too much. Um, yeah. So I think yeah. there there is. So you have sea pens, which are kind of like. Think of your old school feathered pens that have that kind of, you could saw on that one we just lock, looked at, this kind of bushy end. And they're really related to our sea whips as well, which are kind of those long, looks like a whip. I mean, I feel like they're very adequately named. And they're a type of octot coral. Is that one on the screen now? Yeah, that looks like. Yeah. Looks like a that looks like a sea whip, Remy. Do you what do you think that is? Yeah, it looks like a sea sea pen to me. I don't unless we get a zoom and think it's a other type of coral, but looks to me like a sea pen. Just now, um, the slope is starting to kind of even out. Um, as you can see, you know we had a couple of couple of walls here and there, but we're we're getting pretty pretty flat up here as we go. Um, still a gentle slope. Um, depth is currently ap approaching 410 meters, 410 meters. Looking for a kind of higher density of, of coral that was uh, observed in a couple of prior dives. So Dave, I have a comment for you. I love how Dave isn't actually allowed to film slash edit with the camera. He's the one who installs and fixes them and makes sure that they work. That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. I have shot before uh, and I have edited before, but um, not my strong points, uh, just because I'm not as interested in it as I am in, uh, in systems design, installation, that kind of stuff, making things work. Uh, I did, uh, part of my career, I was on a uh, three-person uh, video documentary crew uh, sponsored by the University of Alaska and the State of Alaska Department of Education. Uh, and we traveled all around the state for uh, a couple of years. Uh, and we uh, interviewed elders. Uh, we did, uh, uh, we interviewed people in their, in their native language for language preservation culture preservation, uh, and we shot uh, numerous interviews in very small places. So I've been all over the state of Alaska in small villages, towns, and uh, uh, interviewed yeah. a lot of people. I've seen hours and hours and hours of native dance uh, and documented that. What do we got? Looks like we have what a black kind of coral on the left, and then uh, don't, not sure this type of fish. Yeah. Yeah. Is it almost kind of squirrel fish looking? Oh, I think uh, once we get a zoom, I think, I think we'll be able to tell. These are shallower depths than I'm used to looking at in these regions, so I'm not starting to get into things that I don't often see. Oh, no, definitely not a squirrel fish. It's cool looking, though. Yeah. It seems to be uh, hoovering the seafloor. It does. For some kind of food. It's got a so. purpose-built mouth for that. <laughs> it has yeah. some pretty strong-looking dorsal spines to it as well. Yeah. So I got the idea here. I'm going to look up the scientific name quick, too, but or the common name. So it's part of the spikefish family, or genus, um, Halardia. So the actual species is Halardia goslinii. Um, yeah, I've never seen one of these before. But pretty distinct. <laughs> yeah. He definitely stands out in the guidebook for sure. I like the red and white spotted malt coloring to it. 
Yeah, what an interesting mouth, too. Yeah. That jaw shape. Definitely looks like it's hoovering around the sand, cleaning that detritus. I feel like is what this usual job of the sea cucumber of cleaning up the sand. Yeah. That was cool. Okay, Real we can cool. move on to find some coral. <laughs> yep, ship's moving all the time. Yep. Just kind of uh, taking the opportunity to see some black coral here. 